right, everybody, Vinny Fisher back with another episode of Total CEO. Hey, you know, I'll tell you, I, it's, maybe it's just the new year, We've, we're in 2018, or I'm not exactly sure what it is, but it seems like more than usual, I'm getting all kinds of prospects, requests to discuss the profitability of traffic. And yeah, my answer is always around, you're spending all this money guessing on who your customer is. And worse, you might kind of know who your customer is, and now you're guessing on how to talk to them. Well, I, maybe it's serendipity or whatever word you want to use, but the guest we have today fits exactly into this topic. And, you know, I'm so excited to be talking to him about customer acquisition. What's the cadence? How do you talk? Who are you talking to? And so I'd love to first welcome Jeffrey Shaw to the show. Jeffrey, thanks for being on today. Hey, Vinny, glad to be here. Thank you for having me. So before we dive into some detail stuff, you've got your kind of thing is all about this customer. How do you talk to him? So much so, you've just written a book that's coming out here soon called Lingo. Yeah, absolutely. What is Lingo? Lingo. Well, you know. The bigger concept of Lingo. Yeah. So by definition, Lingo is a shared language amongst the community, right? Okay. So I just took that idea uh, because the, the idea. The discovery of what I refer to as the secret language, actually, this, this book is based on a story from 30 years ago when I was starting out as a 23-year-old photographer. And, uh, but the, the essence of lingo, and this, here's the, the irony of it, if you will, is that it's actually, it, although it's a book called Lingo, it's actually about the unspoken connection between businesses and their customers. Like if you can speak people's lingo, they don't know why they're hooked right? When you're speaking people's language, they are drawn to you. They want to do business with you. They want to be devoted to your brand. They're not even sure what's guiding them. They just, you know, a quote I use often is that people don't hire you because you're the best. No, not anymore. Anyway, people don't hire you because you're the best. They hire you because you get them and they get you, hmm. right? That's a big buying decision nowadays. A big decision as to who people will do brands, uh, do business with what brands is based on of a value connection. I feel like this company gets me. We share values. That actually is a controllable, executable strategy by a business. It's not haphazard. We hear that, you know, we have two brands, one fully accountable, the other one total team. They each do what they do in the marketplace. But our passion ambassadors, the clients that are really dialed in, say that kind of stuff all the time. And I'm always intrigued, like, how does somebody, and this is what you're an expert at, and by the way, everybody, we're speaking to Jeffrey Shaw, and you can go check him out at jeffreyshaw.com. Um, and Jeffrey, your name is spelled traditionally J-E-F-F-R-E-Y. So anybody who wants to go find him out is just jeffreyshaw.com. And later, we'll talk about some cool gift that he has for you uh, tribe members and audience people. So stay tuned for that. But Jeffrey, how does somebody go about like this idea of this enchanted forest, the secret language? I love it. How do... How do you go about figuring out this cadence, this lingo that you speak of? Yeah. Well, you know, the thing, and I'm glad in the intro, you kind of mentioned about, you know, people not even being sure of who their ideal customer is. And this was the big surprise to me. Mm. Here's the crazy thing. I actually wrote the book and then I started doing more podcast interviews and a question kept coming up on these mm. podcast interviews, which was, how do we know who our ideal customer is? I wrote an entire book, which fortunately wasn't printed and published yet, but I wrote an entire book assuming that people knew who their ideal customer was. I know, I tell you. And they don't. I, I, I tell you, I, if I could have one, I'm, I wasn't being like melodramatic. I have this discussion so much and I ask somebody, who's your ideal customer? And they'll go, well, it's, so, it's a woman between 25 and 55. Right. Now, you got to be loving and compassionate, but how do you not start laughing? Yeah. What does a 25-year-old woman and a 55-year-old woman have in common besides being female? Yeah. Yeah. And it's people, you know, if you look at it from the consumer perspective, right? Just knowing their stats, their demographics is not enough for you to right. earn the right to their pockets. Right. And this is a big wake up call. And this is really my big motivation behind writing lingo is because I actually hope that lingo will become the new marketing buzzword. We'll get rid of buyer persona and avatar. Buyer personas and avatars and what, what that represents got us here. So great. You know, at some point in the past 10 years, businesses cared more than they used to, right? They cared enough to imagine their perfect buyer persona or create an avatar yeah. that got us here. But I'll tell you what, if you want to be in business for the next 10 years, you have to know their lingo. 
Right. You want to get into people's pockets and stand out from other businesses, just knowing their demographics is not going to be enough. Okay. This ideal, you know, like I said, I was completely shocked that people didn't know who their ideal customer was. So we actually, I actually wound up writing a beginning chapter and we re-edited the book to add a chapter in to the beginning before we went to, to before it was published so that I could first help people define who their ideal customer is because you can't move That's forward. Hard, right. I yeah. mean, because they're not spending time on doing this. So how, I love to actually help like walk people through like basic mechanics of this stuff. So, you know, by the way, anybody, if you want to go and figure out the step-by-step of this, it sounds like lingo is going to be a book that's going to help you do that. And so if you want to see more of what Jeffrey Shaw is up to, you just go to his.com if, and his book is going to be here, but you know, how do you, I, I, I kind of know a little bit of this cause it's what we do, but how do you, how do you help somebody dial into their audience when they're not even thinking about that? Yeah. So, well, step number one, that's why we're out there, right? We're out to tell them you have to think about this. Yeah. You know, I mean, you just, you have to think along these levels. You get to know people this well. The, the key question though, that comes up and it's a pretty common question in marketing, a pretty common question in marketing people, when it comes to defining your audience, people will say, well, whom are you for? The problem is up till now, people first thought about the audience. Like, well, who, you know, who, am I, who are you for? Well, let me think about the, I'm for, I'm for women between the ages of 25 and 55. I've reframed that question to say, you know what, when I ask you, whom are you for? I want you to first look at who you are. Like, what are your innate qualities? You know, what are, what's your personality style? If you're, if you're crass and, and vulgar, or are you really soft and gentle? Like, who are you naturally, you know? And what is your core skill set? What do you have to offer? And then the ultimate question becomes, well, then who would love that? Like, what are you really good at? What's your skill set? Do you, are you suggesting that, you know, our brands are bigger than me, right? I've created them. I breathe life into them. But if you go work at Fully Accountable or Total Team, I might be its ambassador and its founder and its big checkbook writer. But are you suggesting, and, and maybe rightfully so, that the brand will emulate my personality? It, it, there's a, you know, you can make a personality up to a brand, right? Mm-hmm. A brand can have a per, Geico has a personality, yeah, right. right? Who knows who the people are? Up but here's the thing. What about companies like, you know, uh, Tesla or just Elon Musk, Richard Branson, right? They have Richard Branson has dozens, if not hundreds of brands that, that he owns, yep. but there is a personality essence, right? Elon Musk is a great example of that. I mean, there's, there's a personality behind Tesla, SpaceX, and we identify that same thing with it. You can say that with Apple. I actually think Apple's kind of going through a funky time right now. Um, I'm a huge loyal buyer of, of Apple, but I'm giving up on the iPhone, I think. You know, I'm kinda, I've kind of had it. You know, there's, there's too many glitches with it. The other day about this exact thing and he's moving. I'm like, why? Yeah. I think they've lost their identity. They've lost their identity. And it's interesting to see the, I believe some of that outcome is because of the loss of Steve Jobs. Not that there aren't other people that can do his job. Not that, you know, but there's this core personality that has been lost. So so let's let's say that you ask the question, who are you? And someone kind of gives, let's say a generally self-aware answer. Where do you go from there? Well, then once you, you know, like I said, the ultimate, the question is when, who would love that? That helps you define who your audience is. Like who would love that part about you? I like to use comedians as an example, right? You've got some really vulgar comedians and you've got clean comedians, you know, ever, not everybody is going to love a vulgar comedian, right? So you got to define my wife. She is not a big fan of that type. Of exactly. So you got to then ask, well, who's going to love that? Who's going to love your style, your brand image, your voice and personality of that brand? That helps you hone in. And the cool thing is, and something I talk about in Lingo is I, I have a whole t- chapter on what I call the new niche. Okay. Right? Because I would love to redefine the way business has been thinking about niche because it, it, it's always been one of my, my uh, contentions. Because I'm a creative thinker, as a lot of entrepreneurs are. And the idea of doing one thing to one audience drives me crazy. It's like, there's way too many things I want to do and that I do. I'm a photographer. I'm a business coach. I'm a podcaster, you know, a speaker. I like to do a lot of things. Being held back from that is going to drive me crazy, right? So I don't want to be told the old niche, find one thing to do to one audience of people. The new niche is when you can understand what your core expertise is. My expertise is in helping uncommon entrepreneurs market and promote an uncommon type of business, right? I can't, I'm not good with groceries or something normal. Like give me something unusual and I can show you how to make money at it. When you get your area of expertise, your new niche, you actually then can expand horizontally. You can suddenly see why there are a lot of different audiences. 
that can benefit from this. So it's actually for the first time, I think niche has a, a, the possibility of being an expansive. So once you've defined- By the way, I, I, I really appreciate that. You and I might actually become friends. I think <laughs> niche out in the world is misused. Absolutely. Niche helps define community and people more than it limits you into the scope of, of I, I, I'll tell you, I think it's, it's unfortunately used to confine when yeah. it should be used more to define. And yeah. uh, I love where you're going with that. So yeah, that's I mean, I could have stayed being a coach to photographers. Right? I was a photographer for 33 years. That's who originally started coming to me for, that's who I started coaching. I was coaching photographers. I could have said, hey, I'm a coach to photographers. But what I realized is that, you know, the, the challenges they face are no different than just marketing anything unusual. Now I'm able to coach, you know, podcasters, other coaches, speakers, designers. I coach people, honestly, to this day, we can't even define what it is that they do, right? They, they, they're doing something in the world that's so, you know, things with technology and computers, like there's no known title for it, right? But how do you market that? It's, it can be hard. Yeah, but that's, you know, so what I've seen in my own experience and the people that I coach is like once they own their area of expertise, it actually can spread broadly. So once you define that initial audience that would love what you do, you can then start saying, well, you know what? And that audience would love this too. And that audience would love it. And now you have an expansive model. Really cool. So in lingo, uh, this kind of like secret language, I love it. The unspoken language, I think yeah. is the language you use, which I think is really cool because there is unspoken language all the time, right? How, how do you discover it? So... <sighs> Once you've defined who your ideal customer is, there's a really good chance, I believe, that it's, it, it's very likely your audience is different than who you are, right? There's probably a part of you, right? I find a lot of people, one of the things I do on my podcast, Creative Warriors, we do a, disc, a round of questions at the end. And the first question I ask every guest is, what drives you crazy? It seems like a really random question, but I asked that question specifically because we've just listened to our guests talk for 40 minutes or so about their area of expertise. When I asked them what drives them crazy, you can almost always see that what they do for a living is solving a problem that has driven them crazy all along, or they want to prevent other people from encountering. So there's a, I believe there's usually a part of who you are, but chances are you've grown beyond the need of your ideal Customer. I mean, the whole reason I created both of our brands were to fix a problem. You know, I can't tell you how many times I hear someone say, I'm done hiring people. I only want this size of a business. And it comes down to, you know, hurting people hurt people. and They don't want to lead and train. And I'm like, gosh, darn it. That's what leaders do. Like, and, and, and you're right. You get passionate about or persnickety about fixing a problem. Yeah. And, you know, that's not an issue that we have really in our organization any longer. So I have to live a second identity uh, in, in, in leadership for life beyond the kind of block and tackling things that people need for, to yeah. win a team. I yeah. totally can resonate. Yeah. So because once you know, so once, you know, you, there's a part of you that's lived that where they are, but you've gone past it. So now you need to kind of go back. I, I said, it's the proverbial walk a mile in their shoes. All right, yeah. so if you, now you want to go back and understand, like step number one, there's five steps to building the secret language strategy. The first step is perspective, which is by far the most important one. I always say you can't build a, anything, you can't build beyond that until you first understand the perspective of your ideal customer. What does the world look like to them? Are they pessimistic, optimistic? Where do they shop? What brands are they already interacting with? Are they used to, you know, one of the questions I often ask my clients is, are they more interested in saving time or saving money? Right? How do they live their life? <laughs> because that's a very different consumer if they're time conscious or cost conscious. Right? So you have to really, you know, so what I did as a, as a 23 year old, um, so just a little background here. As, at 20 years old, I set out in the world to be a professional portrait photographer. And I went back to my hometown, uh, which was a small country town two hours north of New York City. Failed miserably for three years. Two hours north of New York City, like Hudson? Like where? Poughkeepsie? Um, uh, Hopewell Junction. Hopewell Junction. All right. Yeah. It is Dutchess County. Now, back in the day, the, uh, the weird thing about Hopewell Junction is it's, it is, it was certainly then a really small town. I mean, we shared one phone number with five houses because there weren't enough wires. 
And, um, it, but it's the production headquarters for IBM. My father is one of the first 90 employees at IBM. That's where, you know, this, this computer startup uh, started their production plant. My dad used to jump the bus or the train at Croton Harmon. So we yeah. know that area really yeah. well. So it was in the middle of nowhere. And, you know, I go back there at 20 years old to, to be a, what I thought would be a high-end portrait photographer, struggled miserably. Finally realized the market for me was a luxury market. I hadn't connected the fact that I was really selling a luxury product as a portrait mm -hmm. photographer. You can't sell that in my hometown because people are barely getting by. Like they're barely putting food on the table. Luxury isn't in their language, right? So I shifted my business three years later. I completely shifted to a different market knowing that I needed to market a luxury product to an affluent market. Problem was I'm a poor kid from Dutchess County, New York. What do I know about the luxury market? That's when I started studying. Like what, how, do you, how do you reach... A different market than who you currently are. Now, I didn't grow up like them, but I had values very similar to wealthy people. I've always thought like a wealthy person. I was 20 years old and had life insurance. My father died at 52 years old and didn't have life insurance. <laughs> you know, I was always thinking about the future, as do people with money. People with money have the luxury of banking things towards their future. They have the luxury of paying for their kids' college education, you know, way ahead of time. Never an issue. So, I shared values, even though I had a different lifestyle, but I needed to understand their lifestyle. So I started, for me, back in the day, I would go to, brick, I would go to every brick and mortar store you can imagine in New York City that was high end, Bergdorf Goodman, Ralph Lauren flagship store, uh, Le Cirque restaurant. I would, what little money I could scrape up, I would go and literally study because I wanted to sit, literally sit in the chair of my ideal customer mm -hmm. and look at the world. What does it look like from their perspective? Right, so you so have to be willing to do that. Then where do you go? You have five steps. I love yeah. it. I love so you. that's step number one is understanding their perspective. You can't build anywhere from without starting there. Step number two, which is incredibly powerful and underused, is familiarity. Familiarity is a really strong human emotion. Familiarity like creates comfort. We know we're in the right place when we have this feeling, oh, that's familiar to me. I belong here. Right. Um, especially I have to say kind of Americans like, you know, Thanksgiving wasn't that long ago. And you think about like the traditions and the familiarity around Thanksgiving. If anything's changed on Thanksgiving, the world falls apart. So how does that show up? Like, are you saying like the, the storytelling and the, and the, and the communication you're using with your prospects, it should breed familiarity. Is that what, what. And probably a lot in style right? Which is actually the next step. So the next step is, is style. Um, so they kind of are closely related because I had to learn what a familiar style was at a high-end store. I grew up shopping at places like Caldor and Kmart and, you know, if they merchandise were on metal shelves and blue light specials. When I started frequenting these high- know Nobody in your life who would know the answer to Caldor. Caldor, right? I used to be the district manager of Caldor stores. Right, exactly. I mean, they don't even exist anymore. Exist. Um, Kmart is gone too, I think, right? Yeah, they're, um, they're around very little. Are they? Yeah. Caldor straight up is gone. Yeah, but you know, blue light specials, are, you know, a lot of people don't even know a blue light special. Like somewhere in the store, a blue light would start flashing and people would run to it because that meant something was on sale. I mean, that's where I grew up. And now I'm, I'm frequenting these high-end brands where it's like dim, low lighting and just really dramatic. Like everybody's dressed to the nines, the salespeople are in suits. You know, it was so foreign to me, but I had to learn like, what is that language? What is, what's the, so it, the, the power of familiarity is the ability to capture that feeling of familiar. So when people go to your website, it should feel like, you know, it should feel like Neiman Marcus, not Kmart. Well, you know, it's funny, like, well, so one of the, you know, we work with e-commerce companies, you know, we work with web-based agencies, digital companies. That's like our, that's our world we live in and where we serve real well. And we would call everybody who manages projects naturally project managers, right? But in agency world, they're called account executives. Yeah. And if we were talking about calling them project managers in the world of the agency world, we aren't familiar with the, the, the terminology and, and the fraternity that goes around agencies if we aren't using their language. And so yeah. it was funny when we switched referring to that person through the lens of, of the agency world, uh, we were able to speak better language to them. Yeah. Here, I'll give you a powerful example of familiarity that a lot of people know. If you've ever traveled in a foreign country, and I have a, I have a very distinct memory of this while uh, traveling in Venice with my kids. I'm there in Venice on, a, on one of the boats in the Grand Canal with my three kids. Everyone around us, of course, is speaking Italian. I don't speak Italian. It's very little, enough to get by. But basically, when you're in a situation where everybody around you is speaking a foreign language, it's just white noise. Yep. The moment someone on that boat spoke English, my head whipped around, right? It's almost seemed, it almost seemed like it was at a louder volume. 
because it was so crystal clear to me. That's the power of familiarity. When you create familiarity in your branding that is so specifically familiar feeling to your ideal customer, it's like laser sharp. Nice. Yeah. And what's the fourth step? So, um, well, yeah, so the third step is style. Uh, and I'll, what I'll say a little bit more about style is style is the decision maker. We make, and people take it for granted, how important the style, right down to font choices. <laughs> you know, everything you do needs to capture the style that is also true of your ideal customer because it's that on which they're ba- making decisions on. We walk down any mall on any given day and people are deciding instantly which stores they go in and which ones they don't based on what's the outer exterior style of that store. Does that feel like it speaks on my language? Like, is that my style? And so I'm a big fan like, of getting stuff out there, right? I'm always afraid of the perfectionist doing and tinkering too much before getting stuff out there. So is there room in style to kind of improve that as you go? Yeah, I think all of this, Vinny, honestly, I think all of this is possible to improve as you go. Yeah. You know, it would be in a perfect world, people would get this information before they started a business. Because you know what? I bet you know this too. I would say 95% of businesses are built backwards. Oh, absolutely. Right? I, I, that's why we built our brands. Jeffrey, I don't think a real business starts until it hits seven figures. Right. Well, the and problem with it- You do everything up and yeah. then you work on the business. Yeah. Well, what happened when I say we're backwards, what happens is people have a great idea. They start a business, but, and then they spend years trying to fit people into that business. Absolutely. Right. Instead of who's my ideal customer, let me learn to speak their language and then build a business for them. You build well, a business I, I, for them and it's easy. It's true. You gave a great analogy earlier. Wealthy people plan for the future. A businesses that have revenue coming in are capable of starting to think about those things. Everything before that's basic needs. Jam it down their throat. Hopefully someone takes it. So I, think the, I, I love that you said that. And I hopefully I don't get stuck writing a book about this. The business is built backwards thing. But it's... It's literally what drives the engine for a lot of our work because we are helping backward build businesses. Yeah. Don't worry about running out of clients. You will, there will never be an end to people building their business backwards because we get these great ideas and we run with them and yeah. then you're trying to jam customers into it instead of building a business for the customer, Very true. right? You just build it and they will come. Like you build the right business for the right audience, but the, the branding is the language. That's why I refer to the secret language, the, the secret language, because it's the branding, it's the marketing that, that compels them. So style is a, an influence important part of this because it's an instant decision maker as to whether so so all of this to your point all of this you can build on it would be it would be great if people got this as startups but honestly most of my cost most of my coaching clients have been in business for decades yeah, they just they need to businesses right right they need to fix it right they, it might be struggling it might be failing they're not as relevant and this is the solution so many many of my clients have been in business for years so we're always in a path of improvement So step number four is pricing psychology, which I have to say is one of my most fun. Um, There is a very different, very definite psychology to how things are priced. You know, and what drives me crazy, Vinny, is the number of people that complain, number of businesses that complain about their customers being penny pinchers. But then I look at their pricing structure and their pricing structure is like, you know, 1995. It's like, well, you're, you're nickel and diming to begin with. Or the businesses that have these these weird penalty fees, these tiny minute little fees for everything that they do. If you're going to nickel and dime people, guess who you're calling forward? Nickel and dime customers. (laughs) It's why if you just look at plain and simple, you go to Walmart, things are priced to the 100th of a cent, right? You'll buy something for 1287 at Walmart. You go to a high end store and it's just rounded off to 200 bucks, not 195, not 197, who are you kidding? We all know it's only $3 less than 200. A sophisticated client, sophisticated clientele knows that, right? So the high end, it is cut and dry, clean pricing, right? Well, we are here with Jeffrey Shaw. You can find him at jeffreyshaw.com. Jeffrey, you also have a gift for our people at forge slash total CEO. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So it's, yeah, jeffreyshaw.com forward slash total CEO. It's the Lingo Media Kit. So in the Lingo Media Kit for one, which I think is very valuable, is an infographic of the five steps to build the secret language strategy. All right. So now you have a visual of it. I'm real big on having visuals. It also includes a free chapter of the book, which is the chapter on perspective, the most important chapter of all of them. There's also an audio version of uh, the free chapter, which has kind of been kicked up. It's that additional content, sound effects, it's really fun. And so you can find that at jeffreyshaw.com forward slash total CEO. And so we were in pricing psychology. Did you want to say anything more about that or did you want to move on to your fifth one? Well, you know, just uh, like I said, I think that it's overlooked. The power of pricing, especially nowadays, I feel like there's so much concentration on trying to be clever. Yeah. 
you know, let me, let me price it at 497, not 500. Well, just know who you're calling forward, right? If you're calling, if you want to call forward, the people are going to care about $3, then don't complain about people trying to talk you down on your prices. Yeah. Right. There's a very definite psychology to who you call forward. What I like to say about pricing is a lot of people see prices as a deterrent. A lot of businesses are afraid of their prices. Oh, I'm, I'm too expensive. Good pricing psychology is actually a magnet for your ideal customer. You can call forward the dollar shopper or the, the millionaire, depending on how you price things and the psychology used behind that. Yeah. So the fifth and last step is, is words. I mean, you can't write a book called Lingo and not include words. But once you've, once you've established everything else, you know their perspective, what's, what their style is, what's familiar to them, you've got your pricing psychology down. Once you've done all that, now you've got the power to actually use the right words to call forward the ideal customer. Mm -hmm. And again, the way a lot of businesses are built backwards is they build a business, they start marketing themselves, but they're marketing themselves. They're not marketing in a way that they're drawing forward the right customer. And you, you rarely win by promoting yourself. It has to be about the customer. So you have to use words. My, my favorite marketing strategy, Vinny, is what I call self-identifying questions. Um, super powerful. Once you have done all the work to build and understand the secret language of your ideal customer, the, the self-identifying questions are is posing questions that are solving problems that are already in the mind of your ideal customer. If you know your ideal customer, you can then imagine what's going on in their mind. Right. right. You should what those questions. Yeah. One of my uh, coaching clients is, um, she's, I call her a virtual assistant matchmaker. So she finds uh, virtual assistants for businesses. Yeah. And um, one of the things I suggested to her was, you know, if you imagine that overwhelmed, overworked executive leaving her, her office and, you know, maybe they're walking through a subway station. Imagine the power of a sign, a billboard that says, do you want to get your life back? Hmm right? That overwhelmed executive is like, that's exactly how I feel. Who is this? How does this person know this? Are they listening to my conversations? You know, and then it will say, you know, contact so-and-so, right? As opposed to the natural inclination is that very same person would, you know, put up, you know, hire a VA, right? The overwhelmed executive doesn't care about that. You have to tap into their emotional psychology in that moment. That's the power of using words, but you can only use the right words once you understand their perspective in the first place. Love it. We're with Jeffrey Shaw. Hey, so at this, at this stage, we're in a, like where you've laid out lingo. I love it. I love to, remember, we're a room full of business owners, CEOs who are running their businesses. So I love to turn the light a little bit on you and, and ask a question. What do you, what's... Um, What's your biggest challenge here in 2018 in your company? Uh, my biggest challenge is, is uh, recognition, visibility. Okay. You know, um, I'm, you know, I, I was, my transition through my entrepreneurial experience has been kind of wild because as a photographer, I only needed to work with 150 customers a year. That's all I needed. I needed 150 clients a year um, to hit the million dollar mark. 75 of them at least were previous customers. I had an incredibly loyal clientele, right? So I only, in the entire world, I needed to pull 75 people out of the air to work with me. Like it was nothing, right? The big difference now is now as a coach and as a, as a, um, a podcaster and a speaker and now an author, it's a much bigger world, right? I, I have to reach. So my biggest challenge is that I've not had to live to be successful as a photographer, I didn't have to live with big visibility. I just had to be well known amongst a really small group of people. You know, statistically, my photography clientele, you know, the whole one percenters, right? Mm -hmm. Statistically, my clients are less than half of the one percent, right? If I look at their economic, you know, what it means to be a one percenter and who they are. So it's a really small audience. So my biggest challenge, not only just strategically, but also in my own head, which is always our biggest obstacle, right, is to think that big. To think as big as I need to think to sell a book, right? To, to be that broad. That's that, so that level of recognition and exposure. Um, and again, I always say recognition is nowadays recognition is a strategy. It's not an ego feed. My ego doesn't need the feeding, right? I'm pretty confident in what I do, uh, confident in who I am, but I need the recognition in order to have the platform yeah, to make the I would impact. Say also, it's not really an ego thing. I'll be, I mean, I'm a marketer. It's what I do. If yeah. you are in the business if you are the part of the brand and you aren't in the business of self-promotion, there is an issue. Yeah. If you ain't going to do it, ain't nobody going to do it. Yeah, I, no. just, you yeah. got to do it. And so, yeah. all right, well, that's a real challenge. Yep. What's the, um, 
what what was the most satisfying part of writing the book? Oh, um, first of all, I loved my editor. So I have to say, I got a, I just, I had a relationship with, which was my second editor. I actually switched to editor in the 11th hour. Wow. Um, I, I mean, actually I was, did that my first book. I, yeah. I got a recommendation and I, she is now the second one has traveled with me all the way through my third book. And she, I'll tell you, the editor makes the whole process. Absolutely. You know, my first editor, great, well-known, came highly recommended. She just, we weren't on the same page. We weren't speaking the same lingo, which I thought was the irony of it. So I switched. So that was certainly big, but, but I have to say, um, you know, it's, it's, I've got, a, I've got a close Facebook group. I've got a lot of followers of Creative Warriors podcast. And the, 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 absolutely the best part has been the interchange between me and my peeps, right? The people that I see as my ideal customers, there's been a real rapport as I've been developing the book, asking them questions so I understood their perspective more deeply, you know, testing things on them, um, getting the galley copies out and getting feedback. So to me, I actually feel like I opened my, my community. That's okay. actually absolutely been the most fun part. All right. Well, here we are at the magic moment, Jeffrey. I uh, I really appreciate the time we had today. You know, if you're going to leave someone with one bit of advice, and they first off they can go get your book, Lingo, which I'm looking forward to reading it and all the things that go along with that. And they can go check you out and and find if they like you, they can find you at JeffreyShaw.com. But if you're going to leave them with one bit of advice, what's this? If they do nothing else, say go do this. What would that be? Stop. <laughs> You know, I mean, stop and just consider, are you working with your ideal customer? You know, one of the things I talk about in the book is busting up the Pareto principle. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to argue with what's been a well-known principle. The Pareto principle is the 80-20 rule, yep. right? 80% of your business comes from 20% of your customers. I'm not saying it's wrong, but you know what? For a lot of businesses today, we, we can't afford to waste our time. That eight, eight out of 10 customers are a way to waste our time, which is what that's saying, right? So stop. Are you working with your ideal customer? Because I will tell you the fastest way to a profitable, easy, successful business in life is to work with the right people. Have every one of your customers be a big payoff. Don't settle for just 20% of the people you work with being a payoff. Make all of them a good payoff. So slow down, stop. Are you working with the ideal customer? And then once you know the answer to that and you know who the ideal customer is, speak to them. Speak their lingo. Make your life a lot easier. Build a business. As we were saying, build a business for people. Don't build the business you want and try to fit them in it. All right. Well, cool. I'll give you one bit of advice on live on the screen. If you want to become more notable and you want some speaking and awareness, go become friends with event planners. Yeah. The, yeah. They, they're, they're the ones who are charged with putting really cool people Absolutely. Like you in the right yeah. spots. So. Yeah. It's the event planners, you know, go find out the world you want to be in and go find those event planners. They are overwhelmed with the need to put good people in good spots. So yeah. And know their lingo. I mean, that's kind of, honestly, that's where I've been at for lately is, you know, meeting with uh, meeting professionals. Like they even want to be called meeting professionals. They actually don't want to be called meeting planners. Whatever they are, they are. But those <laughs> yeah. are the people I would be talking to. If they yeah. Definitely Absolutely. Think. Yeah. No, yeah. That's the strategy we're working on. Like I said, I first wanted to get into the world, understand them. And now it's uh, getting to know a lot more of them. Yeah, that's right. Thank Great you. advice. Thank you. All right, brother. Hey, happy new year. Best wishes on the launch of Lingo. We're, we're our big fans and looking forward to supporting that. And uh, let us know, uh, you know, don't be afraid to reach out into the world of the tribe. They're very helpful and want to help. So part of getting, being aware and seeking greater awareness is to ask for the help. So absolutely. Have a great day, Jeffrey. Nice. You too. Thank you very much.